Thank you, and Mike Ball. All right, set. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a couple of quick notes. So uh, one is, you already mentioned it in there. You were here earlier that I originally encountered this in the, the class uh, mining massive data sets, which is a Coursera class. Um, and somebody on the Meetup site linked to part of the, the text that they use for that course. And uh, if you're interested in Minhash, Minhash specifically, that has a much simpler explanation of it than Schroeder's original one. So uh, definitely check that out. Um, also, I, I tweeted this notebook. This is a Jupyter notebook, if, if you know what that means. And it's in a slide format, but I put this, I tweeted this about two hours ago, and it's on, it's on my GitHub. So, But as Brent noted, there's a couple of rendering errors on GitHub where the equations didn't quite come out right. So um, you see weird things. There's two, two possibilities for weird things. One is they're just weird, and the other possibility is they didn't render. Um, so this, this paper goes back to 1997. Uh, Andre Broder was working for digital back then in the research department, and he was working for the Alta Vista search engine. Um, I have a feeling that some of you are probably not old enough to have encountered <laughs> <laughs> Alta Vista, except uh, maybe on it used episodes. To be the best. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. if you watch park episodes of Parks and Recreation, they sometimes <laughs> use it. So, um, but it was kind of the cream of the crop of search engines prior to Google. Um, the problem that he was trying to fix was that you'd go to Alta Vista and you'd search for something and the top 10 documents would all be variations of the same document. Um, I think that's still to a certain extent a problem in, in search and, and uh, uh, Broder does work at Google now, although his emphasis is on what they call computational advertising now. Um, so what he was trying to m make in this, create in this paper is two metrics. One that describes the resemblance between two documents. In other words, how similar are they? And the other one uh, was a containment metric. So, you know, is this document contained in another one? Both of them range from zero to one, um, as is typical with similarity metrics. Um, and he points out also that if you, if you do one minus the resemblance, you get a, <coughs> a distance metric, which is a proper metric in the sense that, you know, it, it uh, it, the triangle inequality? Yeah, it satisfies <laughs> triangle inequality, so it, it makes a good metric for clustering applications. Um, to be perfectly honest, I'm going to ignore containment almost entirely in this talk. <laughs> but uh, resemblance is the more interesting thing anyway. Um, so ultimately, he defines these metrics in terms of set and intersection problems. But before he does that, he goes to this section about what he calls shingles. Um, if you've done natural language processing, that type of thing, even you know string similarity matching, you've probably run into this at some point in time. Um, sometimes these are also called n-grams. I think that's probably the more typical term now in, in the NLP world. Um, basically, it's just sequences of tokens. Um, in this case, it's the, the tokens are words within the document. Sometimes it's it's uh, characters also, but. Um, this is just a, a function I stole from Peter Norby's website that takes this, this document here, a rose is a rose is a rose, and divides it up into uh, shingles of length four, or four grams. Um, so you can see how they sort of overlap each other like shingles on a roof, which is why they call them shingles. Um, so this is what the actual metrics look like eventually. Um, the, the resemblance is just the size of the intersection of the set of shingles divided by the size of the union of the set of shingles. Um, and uh, this, this resemblance metric is also sometimes called the, uh, the Jacquard similarity. Um, and containment is similar except the denominator is just one of the documents. So this is uh, containment for B contained within A. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, and again, this is just some silly Python code that shows uh, how this works. Um, the basic thing I wanted to show here was that uh, if the, the similarity between them will depend on the length of the shingle. So in this first case, the shingle is just one token. And so the similarity there is higher because these, these two, uh, two uh, 
strings do share quite a few tokens. In the second case, the, the shingles are two tokens long and sort of similarity goes down because the, the number of pairs of tokens that they share is, is smaller. Um, in the paper, he also talks about two different options for doing this. Um, I'm going to actually cover B first. Um, in the B version, he makes the, the set of shingles and then reduces it to just a, a unique set of things. So in this case, there's there's only three things left after you after you uh, remove the duplicates. Um, the A option, you you identify the shingles in the same way that you la as you encounter them, you label each one of them with an occurrence number. So you can see here that you know a rose is a, a rose is a occurs once, and then occurs down here again a second time. So it has an occurrence number of one there, an occurrence number of two there. Um, this is not super important in terms of the, the uh, approach, but he does talk about it later in terms of different ways to implement things. Okay, that was the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <coughs> the next section of the paper talks about estimating the resemblance and containment, and um, the really important word is estimating. Um, I think. It, you know, the important thing to keep in mind is that he's not trying to calculate the, the, the resemblance or the containment exactly. He's trying to estimate them. Um, so, and you know, this is, this is fundamentally a, a, a technique that's based on probability and randomness. Um, so he defines a couple of things preliminarily. First, he defines this set W. Um, well he, he defines a set W which is a set of all shingles of size w. Uh, and then he defines this, this uh, function min s w, which is the set of small s smallest elements in w. So I got this slightly backwards, but omega is the set of all possible shingles in all possible documents. You'll see later that you don't actually, in most cases, actually enumerate all of those. You don't go through the document and try to identify all of them. But for the purposes of the discussion, you think of it as all the possible uh, shingles that you could see. And then W is a subset of that. And then this function defines the, the smallest items in that subset. And that also implies that the set omega is ordered in some way. Um, and you know, he, he makes the point in the paper that you can, you can arbitrarily order it as long as you are consistent about it being totally ordered. I'm a little confused. I thought that, that uh, when I read this in the paper, it says, fix a shingle size at, uh, lowercase w and let omega be the set of all lab well, label blah, 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 shingles of size lowercase w. So it seems to be that omega is actually the set. It's not so. But what I'm confused about here is whether or not omega <coughs> is the set of all shingles of all sizes. No, it's 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 <coughs> it's. For, for the whole exercise, you're going to pick a shingle size. You're going to pick one shingle size. Right. So you, you know, you, I think I think he talks later about what he uses in, in his experiments as something like seven or something like that. So the abstract set of all of all shingles would have si would have an infinite number would represent an infinite number of sizes, but omega is not the set of all shingles, so it only has one size. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good clarification. But I think it was but I, but it would still be an, in, an infinite set unless they're restricting the alphabet in advance. Sure, yeah. Um, so these bits are just, just preliminary. And then he moves on to theorem one, which is effectively the, the main result of the paper. So the first thing he defines is this permutation pi over omega. So omega, we've said, is the set of all shingles. And pi is a permutation. So it's basically taking everything in omega and defining some sort of permutation of all those elements. And then he defines this 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 function. Just I'm just calling it M A here, which is the minimum of the permutation of a particular shingle. For some reason, I decided to use K instead of W here, but it's it's the same same uh, it's the same thing. Uh, it's just shingles of size K. Um, this this bit here. This is actually the first incarnation of minhash. Um, this is, as I mentioned earlier in the kitchen, this isn't really the way it's implemented now. 
not even really the way he implements it, but this is kind of the, the basis of the idea of min hash is a, a, a minimum of a set of permu permuted tokens. So, <laughs> this, is, this is sort of the key idea of the whole paper, and uh, I'm sure it's clear as day to all of you, so I'll just go <laughs> on the next slide. Um, no, actually, so, the, the theorem says that this is an unbiased estimator of the resemblance. So first of all, unbiased, unbiased estimator just means that if you do this a bunch of times, take the average, you get something that, that approaches the true value that you want. Uh, you know, think of like sample means. Um, so I'm going to break this down into sections. There's there's a lot of symbols here, but there's really only two parts. There's there's this this part, which is the union, the, the minimum of the union of the two uh, the, the two uh, in hash sets, and, and that's both here and in the denominator. And then there's this part to the right, which is basically the intersection of the of MA and MB. So one thing he does in the paper, which I think is useful, is he, he, he describes how this turns into this. The way he says it in the paper is clearly this equals this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it was not at all clear to me why that was, but I, I sort of worked through this and it, it makes more sense to me now that it's actually scrolling up the side of the screen. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty dense you gotta unpack it to understand it. Yeah, and I mean, the way, <laughs> of <course it> would. <laughs> would if you had, I mean, if you had two omegas, one subscript A, one subscript B, could you essentially replace those S A K S A B S D Ks with those? Like, isn't that what's being plugged in there? Right. It's the it's the set of all the ones with size W. Um, these are documents, though. Yeah, but, well, these are, yeah. But the result of that function, S A W S A K, is all those shingles, right? And then it goes through that permutation. And then it yeah, it, it's this is all the shingles in document A. Of, si of size, all, right. Of size K, and this is all the shingles in document B of size K. And that's the same definition as omega, right? Or uh, no. Omega is all the, sh all the shingles in all possible documents. Oh, okay, the entire portion. Just the ones that appear in A, and just the ones that Got appear it. in B, and then pi is them ordered. It's the permutation. The permutation. Yeah. Be be because normally when you define a hash function, if the code, the domain, and the codomain are not the same, but for this for this paper, they seem to have decided that you know what, that's too complicated. We're gonna have our hash function. We're gonna have the outputs of our hash function also be strings. Um. So this is kind of the key part here, is that you've, you've gone from these, these sketches that he calls them, which are you know things that you calculate from the documents, to something down here, which is a permutation of the full set of shingles, um, and showing their equivalent. And it's a semi-wide homomorphism. So again, that was not immediately obvious to me, so I wrote it some stupid Python code for exact specific example, just to show that these two things do, in fact, come out to be the same thing in this one specific case. And you know, by induction, that means that we're straight, right? <laughs> um. Therefore, <laughs> it's too easy. So, uh, and to make it even simpler, because I still didn't really understand it, I I put some prose in here. So, in the original metric, imagine that there are ten elements in in uh, the union. SA and, and uh, SD, or SAW and SDW. For some reason, I switched back to W now. Um, and there are six elements in intersec intersection. So by the resemblance metrics, that means the resemblance is 0.6. So another way of thinking about that is that if you choose an element at random from the union of the two things, there's a 60% chance that it's also in the intersection. That'll, that'll make more sense in a So the next part of the paper, I'm looking at the other part of that 
estimated as the the uh, drive, which is MA intersection MB. Um, so in the proof of the, in the paper, he says, let's pick an up the smallest element of the previous thing that we did, which is the smallest element of the permutation of the union of those SA and SB. Now the probability that that smallest element is in this intersection is equivalent to the probability that the original item before being permuted was in this intersection, which magically enough equals the, uh, the probability equals the uh, set resemblance, which is the thing that we're trying to calculate. Um, I've never seen that notation before. Pi minus one represented the, basically, is that transferring that function backwards? Yeah, it's just basically an inverse. So um, in this case, it means do the opposite of the permutation. for permutation common in computer science circles? It's common everywhere. A, a, a permutation is usually going to be either pi or sigma. Okay, thank you. I, I think it is, especially in uh, uh, theoretical CS world. Um, one, one thing that was... So, uh, they love to use it for a policy as well. Oh. So, like uh, choosing a certain... Like in... in if you were writing machine learning to play a video game, there's a policy mm -hmm. that right. you're waiting for how you're gonna play. Okay. So, so now I'm starting with two. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> yeah, the function I'm starting. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that may be absolutely clear to everyone but wasn't immediately clear to me uh, as, a, as a programmer was that when they're talking about a permutation here, they're effectively talking about a function, something that takes every element in omega and maps it to some, some other element in this permutation. So when I first started looking at this, I thought, well, you take a string, you permute it, you take another string, you shuffle it, and then you compare them, and that doesn't work. It's, it's got to be one permutation that's applied to every set of tokens. Because um, it's, it's really a hash function that's a, a mislabeled hash function. Yeah, that's what I thought when I looked up um, injection on Wikipedia. I was like, oh, look. <laughs> yeah, the injection part, so th there's a part in the paper where he talks about making an arbitrary injection. That actually comes more into play in the, the uh, containment metric because okay. in the containment metric, he's taking, he's modding, he's, he's looking through the set of things and taking every element mod some value M. Mm. Um, so he needs, he needs the tokens to be mapped to integers. Um, so this is sort of the key idea, and I'm not sure I can explain it well enough. I've run this by a few people, and it just it, it took me a while to figure out. So the idea is here is that you, you take you, you have these sets, you union them, you take the permutation, and you look at, say, the minimum element. So th there's, a, there's an assumption that when you do this permutation, any element in the original set can be the minimum element. Um, and that's that's not absolutely true for every permutation, but we're going to assume that's true. So well, if you're if you're taking a random uh, a random sample out of all n factorial permutations. So um, so the idea is that any element in there can be so say you've got ten elements and you permute them. Any element in there can be the minimum element. So if it is the minimum element in the union, then it's also going to be the minimum element in. Um, if it's in the intersection at all. If it's in the intersection at all. But there's, there's, if you have, say, 10 elements, there's four elements in there that aren't in the intersection. There's six elements that are in the intersection. So for me, them, you take the minimum element, there's a 60% chance that the minimum element is in the intersection. So that's kind of the, the, uh, you know, the key idea in, in MinHash um, is that you do these permutations, and you, you get something that, on average, has the same uh, value as the as the resemblance. Now, if you do it once, you're not going to get the, the exact resemblance. You you have to do this numerous times. And in in Broder's case, the way he does that is he chooses the minimum s elements. So 
you can sort of think of the S in the, in the min S as being a sample. Um, as I was mentioning in the kitchen earlier, um, what he does in later work, like I think in 2000 he publishes another paper which is about basically the same thing. And what he does in there is instead of choosing S, the S minimum elements, he chooses just the minimum elements. So he chooses a bunch of permutations. And I think the reason why he did that is because he invented a way to generate permutations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that, that's actually the way minhash is generally done these days, is you, you, you take the set of tokens, you permute them, and then you take the minimum element, and then you do that a bunch of times. Um, and, uh, you know, Broder hit upon that, that approach as well. So instead of taking the minimum elements, minimum S elements as a sample, just take the minimum one that you repeat the permutation over and over. Um, so I know that's not going to sink. This is not going to sink in. It took me a long time, and I run this past a few people, and I know my explanation is not entirely adequate, but it does make sense. Um, so really, the key idea there was that you started off with this this estimator that was entirely in terms of M A and M B. So you, you can go through these documents and calculate what he calls sketches, effectively hashes, for these documents. And that's all you need now to estimate the resemblance between them. So you don't have to have the whole document and compare them with, with you know, edit distance or something like that. You, you've just got these smaller uh, sketches of the documents that you can now use to compare. Um, but the, but the, me the metric that you're getting there is completely different from edit distance. If you if you take a decent sized document, cut it in half in the middle, and plop the top and the bottom, that will barely change the min hash at all. But but the min hash, but the edit distance will be close to max at all. True, but I mean the, the, the real the real idea is that it's impractical to compare full full documents with normal string similarity metrics. Is basically what I was trying to say. Yeah, the great thing about these these sketches is that you, they actually contain enough information that you can then compare them later and get a meaningful right. a, 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 a similarity metric. Which yeah, I mean, which if it was just a you described it as a hash, it's a it's a special pretty special hash. I mean, it's yeah. a hash that has a lot of information. It's not just a random checksum. That's true, and uh, you know, as I, I mentioned in the uh, the meetup notes. This is now credited with being one of the first, if not the first, version of what's called locality-sensitive hashing. So it'd be, I think, the next year in 1998, the two well-known computer scientists, Piotr Indyk and Matwani, is the first name I can't remember, wrote a paper on on efficient ways to do nearest neighbor problems, and they introduced the the term locality-sensitive hashing, um, and they actually cited. Broder's work and, and this idea. I still, to this day, do not know the first use of the term minhash, but that's what it's commonly called now. Um, so the next section is on implementation issues. And, um, you know, it's interesting because he, he talks about taking these shingles and applying a function to them to turn them into a, a fixed length number of bits um, to save storage. You know, you, probably w wouldn't be something that we would do to save storage now, but I think it's, it's still an interesting uh, application because um, one, he's talking about these interesting, these interesting functions called the Dean fingerprint, and also because this is kind of how people do minhash now, is they, they apply uh, hash functions to the shingles. Um, so he starts out saying that we have this, we have this function f, which takes any element in um, our, set, our set omega, which is all the shingles, and maps it to uh, a number, which is between 0 and 2 to the L minus 1. And now um, he says, this is what we can describe the resemblance now as this. So instead of just SA and SB, we have this function applied to SA and SB. Um, this kind of confused me at first because in the first part of this section he's talking about applying F to individual shingles and then in, in this part he's talking about applying it to the sets of them. So my interpretation of this, which I think bears out, is that what he means by this is 
pick this function out, apply it to the first shingle, apply it to the second shingle, apply it to the third. So you end up with a set of shingles with this f, fun f function applied to them. Um, so the next part, he's basically trying to show that um, when you apply, assuming that this function picks a number uniformly at random in this range, he's trying to show that there's not that many collisions and the set that you end up with is basically the same size as the set, the set that you started with. Um, so this, this part right here um, is basically the number of distinct tokens you would expect to end up with if you, um, if you apply this f function to each shingle. And uh, in, the, in the notebook, I, I, made a, I put a reference to um, a document that shows how to derive this. This is, this is actually a, a case of what's called the birthday problem. So you've probably all done this at some point in your life where you go around a room and you find out that you know, two people in the room, you have 20 people in the room and two of them have the same birthday. People actually do that? People actually yeah. do that. My set theory class in, 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 as an undergrad, the professor did that. So, um, and out of 23 people, there were <coughs> same birthday. So um, this, this expression based on the left basically comes from the, the, the number of distinct items that you will get if you choose, um, uh, if you choose n items from a set of two L items. Um, and he, he truncates it to this shorter expression. So he expands it on the, on the right here and then truncates it to only saying there's probably only going to be at most two collisions, you know, two, two things that collide. Um, and so if you, if you work out, like I think he used L equals 40 in the document. So if you work out the, the math on that, basically what this is saying is that on average, the value is going to be pretty much the same as the original set. You might occasionally get a collision, but it's going to be pretty rare. Um, did that make any sense at all? Um, the next bit he talks about, he uses something called Azuma's inequality, which was new to me. Um, but he also says, you know, given the nature of the problem, you can simplify this to use the Markov equality equality, which is relatively much simpler. <coughs> this bit right here is the Markov inequality. Um, so all, all, he's really, all he's really trying to show here is that not only is the average number of tokens pretty close to the size of the original set, but you're, you're really, really unlikely to get anything that varies too much. So he's basically saying that not only is the distri distribution close to the original set size, but it doesn't vary that much either. Um, it sounds much more complicated the way he describes it in the paper, but that's really all that he's trying to show is that there's not a lot of variance in that previous thing that we looked at. So what does he use as f? Um, I did not go into this too deeply because these are really cool, but they're also kind of complicated. And just describing them would probably be another talk. Um, but basically, the, the ravine fingerprint is basically a hash function with a really low likelihood of probability, a really low probability of collision. And what you do is you, you um, basically describe a string as a polynomial. And you, uh, you, you describe the string as a polynomial, and then you mod it by another value so that it will always end up being a certain number of bits. And um, if you read Michael Rabin's paper on this, you'll see that the, that the, the uh, probability of collision, this is essentially a hash function, but the probability of collision is much lower than most hash functions. Um, the other thing which is useful about them and which is uh, particularly useful here is that uh, if you have a string, you can compute them in a rolling fashion. So if you, take a, if you take a section of string, you can compute the fingerprint for that, then shift over one character, 
and compute the fingerprint from that using the results that you already computed for the first set. And so since you're using these shingles, this is, this is fairly efficient to compute on them. Um, this, uh, this technique was actually, I think, first used in what's called the ravine carp algorithm, which is sort of the string uh, matching algorithm. Um, and it, that was basically the idea there, too, is you wanted a, you wanted a hash function with low, low probability of collision that you could compute in this window-wise fashion. Yes, yeah, like it that's is. That's like, because I can just tack on another term, basically, as I'm computing this. Yeah, and you, you, you know, it's, it's largely also uh, a matter of, you know, how, how big you want them to be. Mm -hmm. So um, if, you, if you're willing to use enough bits, you can essentially reduce the probability of collision. So you get to but, play with that trade off. Yeah. But, but if, you're, if, you're, if you're implementing something like rsync, you, you need ravine finger, fingerprints for something functionally similar to this. Because if you're if you're if you're hashing every 64 kilobyte window of a file on one byte increments, it needs it needs to be possible to recalculate that in just a few instructions without yeah, having to rehash the whole new the whole window. Interesting. Yeah. File system and stuff like that are interested. That rolling hash. So if you add something on the first bit, it doesn't change everything. Yeah, the the the, the ravine fingerprint is the like a canonical example of rolling hash. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, that this is not typically used in Minhash anymore. People use simple hash functions that have higher uh, likelihood of collision, but it still works out reasonably well. Plus, plus your, your plus W is going to be like 4, not like 40,000. Uh, okay. So in his version of, of Minhash in this paper, like I said, he's taking a, he's taking a, he's doing the permutation and he's taking the min s elements, which is effectively like taking a, a, a sample. Um, and so what he's trying to show in this section of the paper is how big does that sample need to be to be useful. Um, and uh, he, he, just, he describes that if you, if you have two documents, the, and the likelihood that you're going to actually get the, the things that you want to be in that Minhash in the same in the in the set so that you can compare them it follows what's called a hypergeometric di uh, distribution. But he also says that you can simplify that because of the size of the documents. You can simplify that to a uh, binomial distribution, which is basically what this is describing. So this is this is summing binomial probabilities over this this range here. Um, so for instance, if you had if you wanted to if, if you had two documents where the resemblance was actually known to be 0.7, and you wanted to guarantee that your, uh, <coughs> you, you wanted to see what the probability is that the, the estimate that you have is going to be between 0.6 and 0.8, um, this, this formula will give you that. Um, the, if you look at the paper, and the, the, this limit here, I'm fairly sure there's a typo in it. It uses r minus epsilon in both the upper and lower limits, and I'm pretty sure it means. Okay. Uh, I was wondering about that. Yeah. There's also a typo. I like the typos. Yeah, there's, there's a, a typo in your sentence pointing out the typo. <laughs> <laughs> that was intentional. <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally I thought that was you won the prize. Totally meta on my part. You get the So just to illustrate this, I, I I don't know if anybody's familiar with sci-fi uh, sci stats, but this is just a, there's a function which will create a binomial probability mass function. And so this shows, um, if, you had, if you had a sample of 10, this is basically what that previous formula would give you. So if you had a sample of 10 and your resemblance is actually 0.7, the probability that, it, that you would estimate something between 0.6 and 0.8 is about 70%, which is not too good if you're looking at 50 million documents. Um, but if you have, if you have a sample of 100, the chances that it will fall between 0.6 and 0.8 go up to about 97%, which is better, but still kind of low on, on uh, So if I understand correctly, the, the 
what you're what you're doing here is basically increasing the cost of, uh, of creating the sketch. Yeah. Okay. So the more that you put uh, uh, work you put into the sketch, the better result you're going to get. The more closely it's going to uh, the comparison of the sketches is going to approximate the actual Jakarta prints if you were to compare the original documents. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and this pretty much applies in the other approach I mentioned where you only take the minimum element and you do a bunch of permutations. It's still basically the same idea. Uh, okay. But in this approach you're talking about just doing one permutation and yeah. then taking a sample of 100. Right. In, this, in, this, in, in the approach that Broder describes, you're just doing one permutation and then taking, taking S elements from the, mm -hmm. from the permutation. One thing I don't think I mentioned in there is that uh, I did mention earlier that um, he doesn't describe too much. There's, there's a section in there about how to choose a permutation. And when you get to that, it says something about, well, we need to choose a permutation. Or we can just let the fingerprint work as the permutation for us. So he, he doesn't describe that in a great amount of detail. Um, he does, however, write another paper a few years later um, about how to calculate what he calls minwise independent permutation. Um, so the ideal scenario is you have what's called a pairwise independent uh, permutation, but that's hard to do. That's, those are uh, costly to generate. So he, he devises this thing which he calls a minwise uh, permutation. And the basic idea of a minwise permutation is that there's an equal likelihood that any element in the original set will become the minimum element in the permutation. That's, that's all he means by minimize independent. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's basically it. He gets to the end of the document at, at the end of the paper and he says, okay, we've done all this work, now what do we do with it? And he very briefly uh, describes <laughs> how he goes about clustering these, what is it, 130 million or 30 million documents? Um, and so he's, he's devised a way to compare them more easily but he's still got 30 million documents. And so even if you have a fast way to compare them, you're still looking at comparing uh, you know, n squared documents. And so he describes a technique where basically you start with one document, you put it in a cluster, take the next document, you say, is this close to that one? Nope, make a new cluster. And you, just, you keep going through that process. You look at each document and you say, is this, is this is the resemblance to this cluster close enough? Um, if it is, you put it in there. If it's not, you make a new cluster. Um, and so you have to arbitrarily define what you what you regard to be close enough. Um, so in each cluster, are you sticking to one document as a prototype for that represents that, cl that yeah, cluster? Yeah, yeah. He, he says, he talks about what he calls a representative sketch. And uh, he describes two things. So he, one, he says, you can just use the first one that goes into the cluster. Um, and, uh, but he also says that you could, you could Choose it. You can you could formulate a representative sketch, which is basically the most popular fingerprints in the set of uh, hmm. set of sketches in that cluster. Um, he does not detail at all which one of those might work better or which one is more computationally efficient. Um, there is one detail in there that he he says it is likely in practice that each fingerprint belongs to a few distinct clusters. Um, that's a really important thing because, you know, he, like in his experiments, he ends up with something like 5.2 million clusters or something like that. So you can imagine as this goes on, um, as the, as they get bigger and bigger, you get more and more clusters. You're still looking at a pretty uh, uh, computationally intensive problem. But um, what what happens is that the individual fingerprints in the sketches are not likely to be in most of those clusters. And so what he describes is basically you, as you're going through there, you take out fingerprints and you make a hash table of what clusters they're in. And that reduces the number of clusters that you actually have to look at. And that, that's actually a really important aspect of this technique because a lot of times what you're doing with these is um, you're taking a big set of documents and looking at all of the n squared comparisons that you want to make. And and trying to reduce that to sort of blocks that you can look at to, to uh, do the comparisons on. That's actually how I encountered it. Um, 
Brent and I used to work at a company where we did a lot of matching names and addresses from one giant data set to another giant data set. And, um, so that's where this came from. So uh, that's basically it. Um, <coughs> these are some uh, resources that I think are useful in the context of this paper. Um, the first one, one reason I think why Broder uses Rabin's fingerprints in here is because he was really enthusiastic about them and wrote a paper <laughs> a few years earlier about ways to use them. Um, <coughs> again, he wrote this Minwise Independent Permutations paper a couple years later, right, which is also kind of independently interesting. Um, Michael Rabin's paper on the fingerprinting by random polynomials is pretty cool. If you don't know this guy, he was uh, he's not one of those computer scientists that was super familiar to me when I started looking at this stuff, but he's done really cool stuff. He's virtually invented the field of randomized algorithms, and um, he's a Turing Award winner. Mm -hmm. So, Michael Rabin. Um, so he's he's a he's an <coughs> interesting guy, and his body of work spans several fields, all of which he's made major impact in. So if you haven't Um, and then this other paper uh, by uh, Indic and Mathlani that came out the year after Broder's paper. Um, this is another fairly important one. This is the first use of the term locality sensitive hashing. And they give a, they give a formal definition of what it actually means. Um, their application was uh, nearest neighbor search or nearest neighbor clustering. So, uh, I don't know how many folks are in the data mining world, but this is, you know, near, nearest neighbor can be kind of an expensive problem, especially when you get into higher dimensions. And so basically what they were trying to come up with was a technique to make that more efficient in higher dimensions, and what they came up with was locality sensitive hash. And, you know, they, they're specifically talking about, you know, L2 distance, L2 norms and that kind of thing, but it also works for uh, distance metrics like this in terms of strength. And that's it. What's the highest dimension that could really use the L2 norm in? So before we ask questions, can we clap? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for working so hard and understanding this paper for our benefit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's, uh, I know that it can be rough going, and it, you know, there's a lot of stuff in here that you know, you have to go off to other papers and see how other people are doing this to kind of understand how he was doing it. Um, I do recommend, if you work with data, I do recommend the uh, Mining Massive Data Sets class, even if you don't actually follow the lectures, just reading the, the notes and the, the book that came with it. Um, I'm afraid the class is, uh, uh, is no longer available on Coursera, because it's one of the ones that was the generation one that they recently uh, cut off. Okay. Can you still download the video? Uh, yes, the because they're on YouTube. Because oh, okay. uh, uh, so he, uh, uh, the professor, uh, uh, what's his name, that's at the Stanford, uh, uh, has Jury Leskovic or something like that. Hmm? There's, there's two guys. One of them was Leskovic, I think. Uh, he's yeah, that's not the guy that was in the. It, it's the guy that was like, I forgot his name, but I think he used this. What's one of the people that wrote the Dragon Book? Oh yeah, Jeffrey yeah, Oldman. Yeah. That does narrow the field quite a bit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so it didn't take me as long as I thought it would. I guess I should have put more in there about it. <laughs> 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 yeah. well, let's go through the rest of your tabs. <laughs> 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 would anyone like to hear talk about the Kalman filter? I've got a note right on that. Oh, uh, yes, please, actually. <laughs> Can I sign up? <laughs> Um, uh, so, so it sounds like you've got some examples here that, that we could potentially try. That, um, to what extent do you think that might help clarify some of these concepts? Um, it, I, it, if you're willing to put in the work, it definitely definitely clarifies things. Um, there's another notebook in my GitHub repo that's called lsh.ipmid. That's um, got a little bit more. It's it's got a little bit more about simpler ways to do minhash and um, other aspects of locality-sensitive hashing. Um, so, I thought you had that, uh, 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 I 
attempt to summarize uh, uh, some of the, the things you were saying at the very end of this uh, uh, presentation. You were talking about uh, 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 trying to reduce the problem. I mean, the thing is, if, uh, 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 when you're trying to compare every element in a set to every other element, I mean, that's an order n squared problem. And uh, 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 even if you're doing min hashing and you're coming up with these, these uh, uh, sketches, uh, where it becomes less costly to compare them. Yeah. Ultimately, the problem is if you know you're just reducing the constant factor of that algorithm. You're not reducing the the the, the nature of the of the, uh, of the O of n squared. It's still O of n squared. You just made it the, the constant factor smaller. Yeah. So as you get the bigger and bigger data sets, it's still a problem. So then you're trying to break it up into sections, and then maybe you approximate something where the order of, of, of those is something less than O of n squared. Well, that's that's where his comment on the sparsity of the, the tokens, or the, what? Yeah, I mean, like a, 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 a much simpler example. <coughs> uh, so there's this field of entity resolution, which goes back to the 1960s, where people were working in like census data, and they were trying to match people from one source to another source. So again, that's the same sort of problem where you have items that you're trying to compare and you have this n squared or n minus problem. But you know, if people don't live in the same zip code, you don't need to you don't need to compare them. Um, I mean, you might because people transpose the digits in their zip codes, so you might actually. But they do talk about in the, well in the in the other material that in, in the mining massive data sets uh, uh, course, they talk about how it's possible to actually uh, identify. Uh, uh, based on a scale, well, let's see. It's possible to identify that data sets have absolutely nothing in common. Uh, or, or there are two different documents that have absolutely nothing in common. You know, it's a guarantee uh, that, that, that they have no, that none of the shingles are actually exist. And that, and that information is captured in the sketches. But still, that's not enough to, to you would still have to perform the, 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 cal the, the comparison of the two sketches to identify that they, they had nothing in common, right? Well, that's, that's where the clustering comes in. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, so it is, it, is it, is it a example, I is think, it a, a, is it a heuristic? That's, an interesting that's what I'm wondering. Is it an easier way of describing it, right? Like, you, you, you cluster things by zip code, mm -hmm. which allows you to eliminate a, most of the clusters. But, but, but a, a constant factor improvement could, you could still be, can still be worthwhile at all bits of scale when it's a sure. constant, when it's a four or five order of magnitude constant factor right. improvement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, I, I, I'm not sure how large the, the sketches they're using here are, but. Like it's all pre-processing, right? So that you know what cluster right. so clusters you, to go you, into. You spend some time pre-processing each document so that you don't have to compare each so of them to each other one. Right, exactly. I mean, if you're, if you're sufficiently creative about what constitutes a hash function, you can basically turn that, you, 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 can, you can basically re re reduce the sketch comparison to just hamming distance. Yes, that's true. Well, when they talk about in the, uh, in the, in the course, they talk about you know, um, Number of hashes that they're going to put into the uh, 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 into the sketch, uh, uh, and that's on the order of hundreds. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's, you know, and each one of those is represented as typically a 30 gigabit integer. Uh, uh, so you're talking, you know, you know four uh, four bytes times a few hundred to, uh, uh, for the to, for the capture a sketch. Now that's going to vary based on the size of the document as to how much information you're really going to need to, to differentiate them. Uh, uh, but that's the, you know, the, the, the uh, approximately how big you're going to need for that. So that's still, if you're comparing those, even uh, 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 that's never going to be completely cheap. Yeah, I mean, this is still a big problem. I mean, big in the sense of large. Uh, and, you know, you're gonna need a spark cluster or something to do this at internet scale, but. Um, you're gonna need a what cluster? Spark. Apache Spark? Apache Spark, yeah. Hadoop, not the news, Hadoop. 
Sorry, my, 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 my brain is in 1997. And I, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I went straight to Sun as well. <laughs> so in, in uh, psychology, uh, concepts of sim similarity uh, and difference between things are, are grounded in, on entirely different ideas. Uh, uh, what, what this is is interliteral sameness. Not, yeah. not, not, not yeah, this is just all. syntax. Totally uh, same yes. at, at yeah. the superficial level. So in, in psychology, when we're talking about si similar things, there's there's one significant branch, and that's superficial similarity and structural similarity. Structural similarity then lays the foundation for things like an analogies and metaphors and, and, and so forth. So things that are met, met at, at, that are analogous to, to each other would not be picked up on this. That's yeah. not what this is, this is designed for. But what importing some of those ideas into computer science, rather than doing literal comparison of the actual contents, uh, another approach which, which, which would help with some of the scale is to uh, compare their structures. Uh, and since we're dealing with the English language, there are sentences, there's paragraphs, and there's, there's grammatical structures to this. And if two documents have very, very similar structures to them, then they are much higher likelihood of actually being similar documents in one direction, which is what this, this is applying, uh, looking at. Well, ar arguably, you could drive that, that n-gram tokenization process yeah. just based on a, a, a different sort of way to parse the document. Well, there's actually, I mean, the so on, the, on, on this topic, so n-grams were a big hit for a lot of NLP, and by, you know, 2001, text on phonemes and word level, but still it had this problem of how big the engram is, and it is mostly in, you know, a syntax so capturing. Point, point but the now it has been extended by Google to word vectors, which is kind of an extension on uh, engrams instead of being a, a strict uh, shingle window, being a probabilistic, you know, jumping of putting things together. And they've noticed through this that it actually captures a lot of semantics of a word and then people have now ex extended that to you know word uh, you know sentence vectors and document vectors which uh, probabilistically capture semantics uh, without having to do parse trees right so, so th th the point is, is is rather than looking at what you might say is the first order comparison look at the second order or really yeah. some of the structures rather than, than the literal con content because there's there's a lot of important um, and this uh, would still be kind of a, a first order but it, I mean it does a good finish job I, I would argue not uh, I, I mean you know, it, it, I, I, for the I'm, next I'm sure I mean it depends on what you what what problems you want to solve so. exactly for the next the, the, certainly I, I think that there are some interesting areas of, of research that you might be delving into and, and it, it sounds like they're not trying to, to cover that in this particular paper no, 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 it's they're an not, interesting but, concept but, but yeah. th this approach has uh, has a very limited uh, scope of application it yeah I mean definitely you're, you're making a very superficial sort of comparison yeah I mean the, the problem they were trying to solve was somebody publishes an article and somebody else publishes it, but they insert their ad into it. You know, so that yeah. that was basically the problem. But yeah, the, the concept of the shingles or engrams got people ten years of research, <laughs> of lots of improvements. Mm. So I mean, I mean, th theoretically, you could apply the same thing to a semantic structure as well. Well, it would be implemented differently, but the concepts would be very similar, wouldn't it? You just have to capture the semantic information or uh, uh, some different kind of information in the sketch. Yeah. You have to distill it down. That's yeah. as you're getting at by yeah. saying, you know, how do you approach tokenization differently? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's generally that the constructing of the parse tree is the most expensive portion. But I mean, there is a lot of. I mean, that that side of NLP has progressed a ton and has gone um, pretty so, far. So, so uh, all, all you need to do is feed your document to a to a thesaurus, and then it'll look completely different to, to this algorithm. Well, so, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> ten years of spam. But, but not to, <laughs> not to work. There's a fundamental confusion. <laughs> Natural language, the language that we use to speak, mm -hmm. verbal language, and written language are more different. They, they, they yes are, and no. No, no, I mean, it, it is true. I mean, there, there was a big problem with uh, the 
difference between doing speech to text with news versus uh, telephony. And so news was better for a lot of different reasons. One is everybody speaks the same. And they, they speak different pictures, right. less. <laughs> but but, but jur journal journalists have known for decades, if not centuries, that the surest way to make someone look like an idiot is to quote them verbatim. No. <laughs> so, so part of the problem is, is that uh, in, in linguistics, there's this assumption, and Chomsky had a lot to do with it, that we speak in sentences, which is absolutely yeah. not true at all. Well, right? I don't. We do, we do <laughs> sentences. <laughs> we do <laughs> sentences. <laughs> but there's a lot more to natural language than what is, 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 is expressed in sentences. Oh, yeah. But I, I mean, I think and so that natural I would read up processing, on just, uh, just processing of verbal language is a much more complex, uh, it's, it's different than, than processing text language. Because mm -hmm. text and, and, li and spoken and written are two very different forms of language. In fact, written Spanish and written English have more in common with each other than written English to verbal English have in common with each other. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. Just the process of writing something down and the struggle in that, the fact that it's not natural, and it tells you that yeah, it's, 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 I think you'd be interested in looking at word vectors, because um, they, they have some semantic uh, niceties. They published this, what, uh, six months or a year ago? No, probably five years really? or six years ago. Didn't Google just come out with something very recently? They've come out with a lot of stuff. Like one of the coolest things is the neural Turing machine where it has uh, memory inside of a deep oh, neural yeah. network. That's so just a trip. I was like, um, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure all these problems are solved by paper. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Right, you're gonna read some paper in the '70s, and you're like, "They basically had this <laughs> memory thing. Yeah. They just were missing an efficient way to actually." So, they, uh, when, when, when the process and memory were f first founded, uh, first you, you thought of being separate things. It's a time when they were materially different. Processing was done in vacuum tubes, and storage was done <laughs> on the Yeah, yeah. Uh, nowadays, they're done on the same material. There's no, and and the separation between processor and storage. It is actually now more of a problem. Uh, you see the HP thing. They're doing this <laughs> machine. I mean, who knows oh, HP? Yeah. So, 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 so I'll, I'll, I'll throw a concept at you. Uh, in, intelligent memory. We're at the very fine grain. Every that's what that's what we are, right? I mean, it's the same. We don't we don't we don't separate processing and storage. Yeah. It's all yeah. process what, what storage. And what, I don't know so, so that that's the, the, the you know, in, in the commercial sense, the only thing that form of it that exists is content addressable memory that are used used in switches. It's that if it, it's combining, uh, and it's not a formal con formal concept. I I coined uh, I'll say that I coined the term uh, 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 processing memory. If for example, if, if you combined with every storage element a adder and you bundled those two together, so you <coughs> could at any instant add a number to an array in parallel at the same time. And instead of it, instead of doing you pulling should, something out. You should look into HP the machine. Uh, they the essentially, thing. yeah, they're they have an open source project for the software for it. And mm -hmm. they're open sourcing a lot of the hardware as well. They're they're interested in the business of running data centers full of these things, whether or not they'll compute. <coughs> but they they've well, they essentially have. moved computation to the data layer. So they should have moved computation to the webcam. That's where it's at these right. days. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's kind so of it's, it all happens like in parallel. So now, now that we you know have chips that have hundreds of cores and and memory, and it's all on the same chip, we're starting to backtrack on the separation between storage and processing. Mm -hmm. And when you think of it, if you're going to store something, you have to at least be able to do pointer arithmetic. The, the organization and the structure of the data has a processing element to it. That should be in the storage chip. Why is pointer arithmetic, uh, arithmetic done outside of the memory chip? Is that what you're doing? If anybody's looking for suggestions of papers to cover, there's a there's an interesting paper in this month's uh, communications of the ACM about using FPGAs in data centers. So <laughs> I don't get it yet, but it's a really cool idea. So uh, FPGAs uh, <coughs> there now have 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 reached this. Uh, 
have an efficiency in power and a small scale uh, that they are really competing, even with little microcontrollers. Uh, uh, camera interfaces, ha camera videos, uh, even the SPI, it's um, uh, you know, chip to chip interfaces. Um, F FPGA is becoming incredibly competitive. Yeah, yeah Microsoft. It, it, seem, it seems to me like FPGAs are, go are going to get a large amount, are going to do much better from a, from a comparative perspective as we get deeper into the dark, dark silicon era. <laughs> because the overhead on FPGA is memory cells that never switch and don't consume power. So if, you, if, you're, if you're in a dynamical regime where you're power, where you're power limited, an, an FPGA is going to be a lot more attractive than if you're in a regime where you're area limited. Now, in these data centers where they're talking about using FPGAs for the data center, do they really mean ASIC? Because no, no the, they really mean they're FPGA. They're programmable, like they can tell. So they, they're dynamic. They can, they can basically, it's like a program. My understanding, very high level, is just that they're a programmable ASIC, basically. Like, I can tell yes. it to be a different kind of ASIC. Yeah, well, that's well, right. But I imagine they would have FPGA designed the, the circuit opposite and of an after they're, that. They're there are two ends of the extreme. An ASIC is application specific. Right. And well, FPGA is, is that's, a, that's, a, that's a matter of definition. Then yeah. uh, it, it's right. really uh, an FPGA is made application specific. It's just not as dense as an ASIC because it is it is generalized. Right. Uh, but the, the nice part about well, it is the they can control tell control it to be a different ASIC on demand. Is essentially, but isn't it? A, it's a, I believe it's a lower density because of there's there's overhead yeah, with, with okay, the yeah. FPGA. Yeah, it is, yeah. But, but the, the nice the, part the is terms are meaningless in isolation. Yeah. yeah. But the nice part about FPGA is that you can do it over a larger area in parallel, um, rather than rather than just all all having like with an ASIC, that's great. But you know you're you're stuck with that one thing. Well, not with an FPGA. Yeah, not with an FPGA. <laughs> it's less efficient, but you can do it over a larger area, so it it actually no, 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 it's, so it's, it's it's actually that that less efficient. Uh, it's catching up on <coughs> catching up yeah. to that, and. You could even argue that at some point it's becoming more efficient. I, I, I will have to read up on um, that. In this the, paper, the, they the specifically say uh, they're, they're not ASICs, they're real programmable right. chips. So, so, and so you, know, you, can, you can someday I'd this like chip to would be optimized for database right. access or something. Yeah. Someday I'd, I'd like I, to hear I, your I, opinion I, on Landau or Bremerman. The thing I was kind of excited about reading this is that if you have that.